Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. What are the nations of the world at the United Nations doing to combat climate change, especially as it pertains to the devastation of the oceans? My guest today is an expert in this area. My guest today is Mr. Andrew Hudson. Mr. Andrew Hudson heads the United Nations Development Program's Water and Ocean Governance Program. Prior to joining UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, Mr. Hudson was Executive Director of the Center for Field Research at Earthwatch. Andrew Hudson, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you for having me, Bill. I appreciate you being back. We did this three years ago, mm -hmm. and, and, and we've got a lot to talk about yes. today. Let's very briefly, Andrew, talk about UNDP, the UN Development Program. Just generally, what is the purpose of UNDP? Yeah, UNDP, United Nations Development Program, it's one of many United Nations uh, agencies headquartered here in New York, but with, uh, I think, uh, over 130 country offices, so a very strong presence on the ground in many countries. UNDP's mandate relates in particular to poverty reduction, uh, equity, and reducing um, uh, inequality in the world through areas such as promoting democratic governance, uh, improving environment, because environment's critical for, for sustainable development, maintaining your environment, uh, and in other w areas, gender, gender equality uh, included within UNDP's mandate. Mm -hmm. And your office, the Water and Ocean Governance Program within UND UNDP, what is your thrust? Right, so we sit within the UNDP Bureau for Policy and Program Support, and then within that, the Sustainable Development Cluster. And so we focus on, obviously, sustainable development as it pertains to the governance and management of water and, and ocean resources around the world. Mm -hmm. And our viewers can go to www.undp backslash, no, dot org backslash water. That's right. And focus in on your program. Yes. Or just go to undp.org right. and focus on the whole <laughs> of the organization. Right. Right. Well, let's talk about the oceans. And we'll, we'll talk about the sustainable development goals. Yeah, well, why don't we just start off with that? That's a good place to start. The, the sustainable development goals are going to run from 2016 <coughs> to 2030. The development agenda for 2030. They are to eliminate poverty, to eliminate hunger, to promote quality education, to promote gender equality, uh, those types of things. But also, there's there are two or three of them in there that deal with climate change and the oceans. Uh, how important are the sustainable development goals in general, just to focus our attention on all these different areas that that there are major problems? Yeah. Yeah, so in the same way the uh, the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, mm -hmm. really set the global development agenda uh, through 2015, and, and many MDGs were achieved, some were not. And so the SDGs are really an upgrading of the MDGs to much greater ambition, uh, much greater specificity. So as you noted, there's, there are actually 17 SDGs. I think in total there's 169 targets under those SDGs. So it's a very bold and ambitious uh, agenda, uh, and of course the time frame is 2030. That's the end date for the SDG. So it sets some very ambitious um, targets. And so SDG 14 is is oceans and coastal areas, sustainability of them, and it has I think uh, nine targets relating to some of the key issues that face the oceans, from pollution to overfishing to climate change. Mm -hmm. Now over the years we've seen that the United Nations, especially the various UN agencies and former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and even prior to him, uh, Kofi Annan to, uh, to a large degree, focused attention on climate change and how we really needed to pay attention to this and to try to mobilize the world together. The UN held a variety of conferences over the years. You had the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was created by the United Nations, of prominent scientists around the world. 97% of them agree that the majority of climate change is coming because we use fossil fuels and humans are causing a large part of it. How important has it been to have these UN conferences to lead up to where we are today to put the spotlight on climate change in general, oceans in particular? Right, so the, yeah, these series of conferences since the original adoption of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, uh, each year or so they have their conference of the parties and uh, of course the key a key moment in the last 10 years was the uh, 2015 agreement, uh, conference in Paris, which led to what is now widely called the Paris Agreement. And that's the key element to that is that, in essence, almost every country in the world set uh, some level of ambition for their greenhouse gas reductions. And of course, as a, as, a mo as a joint global effort to combat climate change. And really, Paris is, we hope, the beginning of an even more ambitious uh, series of commitments. It'll be a post-Paris you know, commitments uh, to hopefully ratchet up the the effort and the pressure and get get uh, greenhouse gas emissions down to a level. You know, the Paris Agreement technically calls for, um, I think it's officially significantly below two degrees. The real 
ambition is 1.5 degrees to, to limit the global mm -hmm. average mm -hmm. temperature increase uh, to 1.5 degrees C. But it is a very, very ambitious agenda. Uh, we already have hit the 400 parts per million of CO2 in our atmosphere level just uh, within the last year or two uh, from the sort of pre-industrial level of 280. So uh, we really need to take uh, rapid action on all the opportunities, whether it's energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, phasing out uh, fossil fuel subsidies, which you know don't mm -hmm. you know keep an unlevel playing field for some of the renewable technologies, uh, and many many other um, you know efforts in that in conjunction can actually start to address climate change. Mm -hmm. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the scientists or most scientists are in agreement that the fossil fuels are a major contributor because you leave such a large carbon footprint. They heat the earth. You mentioned uh, we really want it's 2.0, 2.0 Celsius. We want to get down to 1.5. That sounds like a very small number, but that's huge when it comes to actually maintaining the, the temperature of the globe, is it not? It is huge. It's not, you know, t the temperature is one element of, of of course, but as the temperature rises, you see all the other impacts of climate change, whether it's more uh, ex extreme, um, both flood and drought events. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, by pushing more heat into the air, you're pushing more water into the air. So you're actually r accelerating the hydrological cycle. So everything's moving more fa faster, uh, with often more intensity, and in many ways with less predictability. And so, um, yeah, so the climate change agenda, and then on the oceans, you know, we're, we're, we're getting a much better handle in the last few years on what are the key issues, key impacts of climate change on the oceans. No big surprise, the oceans are warming. In fact, mm -hmm. if you look at the numbers, something like 80 to as much as 90% of the extra heat that's been added to the global system as a whole isn't in the atmosphere, it's in the, in the oceans. Now, the good news is this has slowed down atmospheric warming and some of the impacts of climate mm -hmm. change. That's good news. But the bad news is the ocean is warming. And of course, the effects on, ocean, uh, on the oceans of warming are number, probably number one, sea level rise. Because of warmer oceans, it's a bigger oceans. Water expands when it, um, when it gets uh, warmer. And then there's things like what are known as uh, deoxygenation. Warmer water holds less oxygen. And so we're already seeing in many parts of the ocean reduced levels of oxygen. And of course, that's a very important parameter for most ocean life, which is mm -hmm. oxygen dependent. Uh, and then lastly, um, changes in ocean circulation because warming waters also change both the horizontal circulation patterns and the vertical circulation patterns, which are very critical because they bring vital nutrients to the ocean surface, which is what mm -hmm. the plankton live, base the whole food chain on. Now, in June of this year, there's going to be a major conference, and a conference fo focusing on the oceans at the United Nations, by, uh, I think co-sponsored by Fiji and Sweden, as I recall. And this is going to be a really a landmark conference as far as really putting the spotlight on, on oceans. What uh, d would you hope would come out of that conference, and uh, what should we expect to, to happen in yep. New York? Yeah, so there's been a great deal of activity and preparation for this conference. In February here at the UN, there was a preparatory meeting where mm -hmm. member states, several hundred member states, UN agencies, governments, uh, NGOs, all the concerned stakeholders got together, made some initial decisions on the full final structure and approach of this June conference. It will be June 5 to 9 here also at the UN. And so that conference will have really three key outcomes. The first is a call for action on, on SDG 14, on the Ocean's SDG. To now, to what is SDG 14? SDG 14 is the Ocean's SDG. Yeah. Okay, this yeah. is the one, the Sustainable Development Goal number 14. Right, for the oceans. really focuses on oceans. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so the first thing for, will be a call for action, and, and drafts of that are already in negotiation and dialogue among the member states. Um, secondly, a series of partnership dialogues, which will be thematic ones covering areas like pollution, ocean acidification, overfishing, and other key ocean issues. Those will, and then, and then lastly, in, in some ways, most importantly, it's something known as the voluntary commitments and where members, really not all, mem not, not, all just no, not just member states, all segments of society from mm -hmm. the biggest company, the biggest government to the smallest NGO or community organization are invited to say, what can you do? What can you contribute to the ocean agenda to SDG 14 implementation through commitments that reduce pollution. You clean up a beach, uh, mm -hmm. you ban a plastic bag in your city, uh, you change your fishing practices, you preserve a, a coral reef as a marine protected area and so forth. So in fact, if you go to the Ocean uh, Conference website, which is oceanconference.un.org, one of the sections is called Voluntary Commitments. And there, as I said, any legitimate entity that is going to do something or is already doing something, mm -hmm. and with September 15th, the adoption of the SDGs being sort of the starting gate, uh, is invited to make a, co a contribution there. And we're seeing more and more. We've got several dozen so far, but we're hoping to get hundreds, if not thousands. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we're organizing a series of, of seminars and webinars here at the 
UN headquarters in the coming weeks to familiarize both member states and other stakeholders with the opportunity that the Voluntary Commitments uh, platform mm -hmm. presents. So they could go to oceanconference.un.org right. and tap page. into it yeah. and become actually involved Very in much. seeing what they can yeah. do to yeah. clean up a beach, as you mentioned, or just you know, cut down using plastic bags or whatever you want to do. And right. it's cr critical that we all participate because exactly. we all contribute to the, to the devastation of the planet. Right. <laughs> We're right. all working in that direction. Yeah. Anytime we flip on a light switch or drive a car or exactly. whatever the case might be. Right. So we, need, we really need to mobilize and work on this. The, you mentioned the overfishing. This has been a problem for years. Uh, how big of a problem is it really? Are, we, are the, the majority of the fish sanctuaries around the world, have they been overfished? Uh, do we see that aquaculture is going to replace the f fishing industry out in the oceans, or how's that going to work? Yeah. So, I mean, if you go back, say, 25, 30 years, the proportion or percent of fish stocks that, according to the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, that were considered, you know, overexploited or collapsed, otherwise depleted, was only about 10%. So, you know, not so bad. Today, we're looking about 30% of, of fish stocks on Earth fit that category. Uh, another 60% are considered fully exploited. That is, they're at their limit. They can't go much more, but they're sustainable. And they may be ma minimum, maximum 10% are underexploited, where there may be opportunity for a little more. So the result is, really, the last 25, 30 years, the total catch from the wild fish catch from the oceans mm -hmm. has been flat at about 80 to 90 million metric tons per year. And in fact, the only reason that global supply of seafood has been maintained where in fact per capita consumption of seafood has gradually increased over that time is is aquaculture as you say so it's grown from i don't know maybe 20 or 25 percent of global seafood consumption back say in the 70s today it is almost equivalent about 50 50 of all seafood consumed on earth by human beings is aquaculture and, and wild caught fish and it's still aquaculture has been growing at a rough pace of say nine percent for almost 25 or 30 years and so I think World Bank projection had it hitting 60, 65 percent by 2030. Now this is good in the sense that yes, we're reducing or at least l maintaining <laughs> the pressure on the wild stocks and, and maybe allowing them to recover. But the downside of it, of course, a lot of aquaculture, probably the majority in fact, is not, is, is not very sustainable. It can be polluting, mm -hmm. there can be issues with invasive, uh, in introduction of invasive species, uh, introduction of diseases overuse of pesticides, antibiotics, which get into the broader ecosystem. So aquaculture is a great thing, but it, we have still to learn to practice mm -hmm. it sustainably, just the same way we need to fish sustainably. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps a university that has an intra campus television hookup, or you just have a website and you'd like to share our programs with people in your community, please feel free to go to the website and to download the programs. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge at no cost. Today we're taking a look at the oceans and the critical role that they play, and especially as we deal with this whole climate change issue and what we can do to slow down the deterioration of the planet. And of course, oceans are a vital, vital feature. My guest today is an expert in this area. My guest today is Mr. Andrew Hudson. And Mr. Andrew Hudson heads the UN Development Program's Water and Ocean Governance Program. Andrew, we're talking about overfishing. We see the projections have been made. The United Nations uh, has made projections about the population. I think by 2050 will be somewhere between 9, 10 billion. We have 7.4 billion on the planet right now. Can the, a lot of people depend upon fish supplies to stay alive, uh, especially you, you have the maritime countries, but and even some of the landlocked countries depend upon them too. Yep. But can we keep up, is there, can aquaculture keep up with this as the population expands over 2 billion probably? Do you think that, they, that we can feasibly keep up with it, providing food for these folks? Yeah, yeah, I think it can, you know, with the kinds of reforms I was getting at on aquaculture to really move it towards sustainability. So just for example, there are increasing examples of um, what's in one terminology known as multi-system or multi-trophic aquaculture. When you bring together, a lot of aquaculture is arguably just single species, you know, all salmon or all uh, uh, oysters, whereas increasingly they're finding ways to multiple species, um, both um, you know, sessile bottom species, fish, 
pl uh, plankton, kelp, and so forth, that you know become more of mimicking, at least at the rough level, an ecosystem. And so, in those kind of systems, the the waste products of some of the creatures become the food for the others. So the the excreta, the nitrogen, and so forth by by the fish and the other animals is food for the kelp. So you can you can find ways to make uh, aquaculture much more sustainable and even make a contribution to ecosystem health. China, for example, has pioneered this, uh, it's called integrated multitrophic aquaculture uh, in their coastal areas as has as Korea. So there's this opportunity there, number one. And then number two, you know, if some of the efforts really under SDG 14 on the overfishing issue succeed in particular in reducing and backing off the fishing pressure on some of the overfished stocks, the good news is if that pressure is reduced, those stocks can actually rebound given enough time and there's many examples where this has happened when, when the opportunity was given. They can rebound, and, and in fact, you, the, s the stocks with enough time could rebuild to a level you could begin to fish again at a higher level than you were. So depleted stocks don't supply much. It makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's opportunities to actually, in principle, even increase the, the wild catch by a, some amount. And then again, to, to continue the important contribution aquaculture is making to seafood product on earth but try to bring more and more sustainable practice to it. Mm -hmm. One other challenge that we have with, uh, with the rivers and the oceans and what have you are the invasive species. How big of a problem is it? It's actually a tremendous problem and really started being recognized say 25 to 30 years ago we had huge outbreaks of invasives in the Great Lakes here in the mm -hmm. United States in the Black Sea and many places. And of course, it was pretty quickly realized the key vector, that is what brings invasive species around the earth, is, is large ships, and in particular, the ballast water they carry, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the hulls, the exterior of the ships. And I've been fortunate almost 20 years now to work on a program called the Globe Ballast, which is global ballast water program, mm -hmm. with the Global Environment Facility, and of course, the International Maritime Organization, the UN agency charged with shipping's regulation. And the, gr the short story good news of this is that um, with in part our assistance, the international community came together back in the early aughts, uh, negotiated a new convention on ship ballast water and sediments, and that convention, based on the ratifications that have been coming in over time, uh, will come into force this year in September. And so that's a huge step for the ocean because as th that convention comes into force, it actually throws about a $50 billion uh, price tag to the shipping industry to install the necessary equipment to treat their ballast water such that it, it will dra dramatically reduce the risk of ballast water being used to transfer uh, invasive species. And, and this is a huge ac accomplishment. And, uh, and I give the private sector, the shipping industry, and, and, and shippers, and container vessels, and everything, a lot of credit because you know this, this is a huge financial hit to the industry, yet they largely stood along with the process and the convention because, in, among other things, it, it leveled the playing field of what was actually a quite different playing field across you know, the European <laughs> Union to Australia mm -hmm. to the United States to Canada, which was actually causing a lot of confusion and difficulty for the industry versus a single standard which the convention brings in. So this, mm -hmm. is, you know, this shows that with the right <laughs> effort, political will, technical support, uh, countries, and really the international community, in this mm -hmm. case, can get together and solve ocean problems. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have the International Maritime Organization, a UN agency that brings together the shipping lines of the world, all the major carriers, to develop these rules, safety exactly. rules, to meet the environmental standards, things like that, just as you have a UN agency that brings together the airlines of the world to right. deal with moving aircraft safely <coughs> in international airspace. Whenever we fly or take a cruise in the Caribbean or in the Mediterranean, whatever, it's a UN agency that helps try to make sure that we arrive safely and we don't pollute as we go. Right. There are so many other issues as we look at the oceans they are so critical to our lives. One that I think really, uh, well, there are two that we'll try to get through before we run out of time, but one is we've heard about the bleaching of the, uh, the, the reefs. This has been a problem for years, the water's heating up, whatever. We see that the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, which is a wonderful landmark or just a great resource, for not only for the Australians, but for the world, is under severe stress and pressure right now. What what is happening there, and what can we do to try to reverse that? Yeah, now, coral reefs, of course, they're unique. Their biodiversity is, is spectacular in terms of the fish and the corals and so forth, uh, and, and they contain large numbers of species. They have very, very high biodiversity value. Mm -hmm. uh, many local communities depend on them for f seafood, for livelihoods, tourism. So extremely important uh, resource. But in, in their very small portion of the earth, of course, they're just these mm -hmm. little bits of coral reef that ring, and the Great Barrier Reef being an exception. But anyway, the, the challenge of coral reefs is they face <laughs> in some ways, insults from, from two sides, both many cases locally, whether it's fishing pressure, uh, diving, over diving pressure, pollution runoff pressure is a very significant issue. At the same time, climate change, warming, 
warming oceans uh, causes, is what mainly causes bleaching. It is, mm -hmm. most coral are, are very, very sensitive to even a degree C or two increase above their normal tolerance temperature, and they will bleach, which is, sh is shooting out their uh, symbiotic algae in mm -hmm. the ocean, and basically dying uh, if that happens. Number two is ocean acidification, is the fact, and I, we should talk about that a little bit, the fact that the oceans, that, that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, about 30% of the amount that we burn as fossil fuels doesn't stay in the atmosphere, it dissolves into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And little basic chemistry here, it, fall, it, it forms what's known as carbonic acid, which is a weak acid, but it's still acid. And so inexorably, as you add more CO2 to the, ocean, to the atmosphere, and then to the ocean, mm -hmm. the oceans get a bit more acidic every day. Uh, and something called the pH, which is the measure of acidity, a lot of people remember that from chemistry, um, is slowly declining. And a decline pH is means towards a more acidic condition. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is these corals and many other shell-forming organisms, including plankton, th they reach a limit where they, if the acidity gets too low, they can no longer form their shells. It literally becomes impossible physiologically to do it. And of course, that mm -hmm. doesn't mean just damage. It could mean <coughs> extinction. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're already seeing, for example, in the polar regions, Antarctic, for example, where because it's colder, the CO2 is dissolving faster. Cold water holds more gases than warm water. Very simple chemistry. And so we're already seeing uh, examples of certain keystone plankton organisms that are already showing, for example, malformation of their shells. Things called pteropods are already showing uh, malformation of the shells because of the acidification. And those are the base, one of the key base uh, organization organisms in the, the fu food chain of the hugely important Antarctic marine ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge issue. And the only way we can address <coughs> this issue, it's, this, it's the same as climate change overall. We have to mitigate mm -hmm. ca climate change. We have to reduce our carbon emissions. That's right. Fossil fuels. <laughs> we have to move to alternative forms yeah. of energy. Yeah. Well, in the last minute and a half that we have, another very stressful sight that we see from time to time are the really square kilometers, square miles of floating plastic islands, especially out in the Pacific. What is, is the UN doing anything in this particular area to try to get rid of them? I know they're dangerous to the fish. Uh, many of the turtles, a lot of the fish try to eat these things. They choke to death. And what do they call it? It's G-Y-R-E, a Jira or something like that. There's a, some technical term for that. I've heard it pronounced about 14 different ways, but it, uh, yeah, I, no, but I you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, what you're referring <laughs> to is there. the, what are known as the central gyres. Of the all gyres, the gyres, that's yeah, it. Of all the major you. oceans. Right, and the, you know, the, pr the problem is you have exactly this massive flow yeah. of plastic coming off all the continents, but mm -hmm. you know, obviously North North America, Europe, Asia, everywhere. And the problem with the ocean is in, in both the northern and southern hemisphere, the major oceans, Pacific, Atlantic, the main circulation, there's lots of sub patterns, but the main circulation pattern is clockwise in the, in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. And so what this means is this, all this plastic goes into these sort of ring currents, it tends to get con concentrated in the middle where it can't get out, in effect, it's mm -hmm. almost trapped. And so you're seeing this so-called garbage patch. These large, I mean, it's not something you actually see in the Pacific if you went in the Central Pacific, but if you started sampling, you, you do see it and you would see it. And so it's a huge issue. I mean, these days the estimate is the world produces about 300 million metric tons of plastics a year, and about eight to 20 million of that metric tons uh, is getting into the ocean every year, which is what, five to eight to 10%. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, it can <laughs> impact o ocean ecosystems from the largest organism, whales that ingest large scale plastic items, turtles, as you said, fish, and then down even to microorganisms, plankton. Because a lot of the mm -hmm. other issue, a lot of the plastics either degrades into very small pieces, so-called microplastics, or comes in already as microplastics, such as some of the ingredients, some of the cosmetics, which already a number of countries are, are banning and phasing out. So it's a huge issue. We're still starting to understand it. We don't have a full handle on the ecosystem impacts, on the economic impacts, but we know we have to deal with this. I mean, one mm -hmm. study suggested on current trends, the mass of plastic in the ocean could come out to be the, uh, roughly the same as the mass of fish. So if, if that's not a tangible that's feeling of an impact, <laughs> that yeah, is frightening. That's, this, that's just not acceptable. So we need to get a handle on this. And quite, you know, it, it, we know what we need to do. We need dramatic reforms and changes mm -hmm. in the whole. Um, solid waste um, systems of the world from mm -hmm. everything from the beginning of designs of, of plastics resins so they can be re recapturable and recyclable to how products are designed so that the plastics can be ultimately removed and recovered and mm -hmm. recycled mm -hmm. to of course uh, especially in the developing world which has few you know uh, plastics collection recovery recycling programs to get that value back 
of plastics. Exactly. So there's a lot of work to do. That's so very true. And the scientific studies are there. We know climate change is taking place. Global warming is occurring. Now we just need to have the political and economic will to make these changes and to do what we need to do because we're all on this planet together and we're going to survive or not survive together. But Andrew Hudson with the UN Development Program, I want to thank you so very thank much for very a much. very interesting and a very informative program. A pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.